In this session, we shall learn how to analyze financial statements. So why analyze financial statements? Stockholders wish to estimate cash flows a firm will generate and profits it will have to determine the value of the stock. Managers would want feedback on their investing, financing, and working capital decisions. And creditors of the firm would want to evaluate the firm's ability to meet obligations. So these are the different reasons why different individuals or different uh, actors wish to analyze financial statements. Now you have the common financial statements which have the dollar amounts in them. Another form of financial statements are the common size financial statements where you don't have dollar amounts, rather you have uh, something like percentages. Now, uh, for example, a balance sheet, common size financial statement, you take the normal balance sheet and then you divide each item by total assets. So what that does is that it expresses the different assets as percentages of total assets and similarly it scales the liabilities and owner's equity. For income statement, you divide by the dollar amount of sales. So what these uh, common size financial statements do is that instead of um, giving you numbers, they give you rather uh, percentages or ratios. And sometimes that's easier to use for analysis. So in analyzing financial statements, we have ratio analysis. Now there are a variety of ratios which may be computed uh, to understand different aspects of a firm's performance. Ratios may be computed to measure liquidity, efficiency, leverage, profitability, or stock price performance. We start with two ratios for liquidity, which are the current ratio and the quick ratio. Now the current ratio is um, current assets divided by current liabilities. And what it tells you is the ability of the firm, this number, this ratio tells you the ability of the firm to meet its short-term liabilities. If this is higher, if it's a larger number, it means current assets exceed current liabilities by a large amount. And that would imply that the firm is in a much better position to meet its current liabilities. An alternate ratio which is similar but a bit different is the quick ratio. In the quick ratio what you do is you do not have current assets divided by current liabilities, rather you have current assets minus inventories divided by current liability. And what is the idea here? Why do you exclude inventory from current assets? Well. Inventories may actually not be very easily convertible to cash. So what you're doing here is that you're excluding inventory and you're just looking at uh, what kind of like uh, assets which the firm have has which can be quickly converted to cash, for example, cash and equivalents. So uh, the quick ratio is a more severe test of the firm's ability to meet its short-term liabilities because it excludes inventories. The next set of ratios that we are going to look at are the efficiency ratios. These measure the efficiency of the firm's operations. 
The first one is inventory turnover ratio, which is cost of goods sold divided by inventory. So what does it mean when you have a higher inventory turnover ratio? It means that compared to the amount which the firm is using to produce its good, it is keeping a lower amount of inventory. So is a higher inventory turnover ratio better or a lower one? Well, a higher one is better because it means that the firm is able to operate with a smaller amount of inventory. So it's able to quickly sell whatever it's manufacturing and the inventory size is smaller. The second ratio is days sales in inventory. And that is found by multiplying inventory into 365 divided by annual sales or alternatively it's inventory divided by daily sales because you divide annual sales by 365 you'll get uh, approximately the daily sales so this is is it good for a firm to have a higher day sales in inventory or a lower day sales in inventory and the answer is a lower one because you don't want the inventory to be too large a bloated inventory could mean that the firm is not being able to sell what it's producing. So again, a comparatively smaller inventory, which would lead to a lower ratio, lower day sales in inventory, would mean that the firm was able to sell what it's producing quickly and is able to maintain a smaller inventory. The third ratio is called accounts receivable turnover. And that is defined as sales by accounts receivable, and sometimes they say net sales by account receivable. Now, what this means is if you have a higher accounts receivable turnover, it means you are being able to maintain a smaller amount of accounts receivable compared to the sales that you have. And is a larger ratio here, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's a good thing because it, could, it would mean that you are able to receive money for whatever you are selling relatively quickly, thus having a smaller accounts receivable. But you don't want to really annoy your customers by kind of you know, keeping on uh, bugging them about uh, getting uh, them to pay. And uh, so it's not, uh, I mean, yes, a lower ratio is nice, but don't try to force it too low. The next ratio is day sales outstanding, which is defined as 365 into accounts receivable divided by sales, or accounts receivable by daily sales. And that, you see, is a kind of a reciprocal of the previous ratio so whatever we said about the previous ratio applies in reverse about this ratio. If you have this to be large, it means that your accounts receivable are getting larger compared to sales. It means that you're not being able to obtain cash from what you were selling from your customers and that may not be a good thing. But of course, remember, you don't really want to annoy them either. The next efficiency ratio is total asset turnover which is defined as net sales divided by total assets. And again, if you have a high total assets turnover ratio, what it means is that you're able to sell more given the amount of total assets you have. So if it's higher, it's a good thing. You're able to have more sales for the same total asset base the last efficiency ratio that we are going to look at is fixed asset turnover, which is very similar to total asset turnover, except now we are not looking at total assets, but rather we're looking at fixed assets. So it's net sales divided by fixed assets. And again, if it is higher, it's a good thing because it means that you're being able to get more sales for whatever fixed assets you have. The next set of ratios you're going to look at are the 
financial leverage ratios. Now, when a firm takes on more debt, what it does is that it can increase the expected return of equity. However, it can also lead to more risk. Or one can say that invariably it will lead to more risk because uh, the standard deviation of the residual portion has to increase if you are taking a fixed amount out. The other advantage of debt is that it can have some tax benefits. Uh, there is a debt tax shield which uh, you can calculate the present value of. There are two sets of leverage ratios that we are going to look at, debt ratios and coverage ratios. The total debt ratio is simply total debt by total assets. The debt to equity ratio is debt by equity. Equity multiplier is total assets by equity, which would also be equal to debt plus equity divided by equity. So you can see that this ratio equity multiplier is also related to the debt to equity ratio or the uh, debt ratio. The coverage ratios are times interest earned, which is operating earnings divided by interest expense. So when you have a higher times interest earned, what does that mean? Well, it means that the firm is in a better position to meet its interest obligations. It means that operating earnings is larger relative to interest expense. The next coverage ratio that we look at is the cash coverage ratio, which is defined as the cash of the firm divided by interest expense. And once again, the larger this ratio is, it means the more likely it is that the firm will be able to meet its interest obligations. Because it, uh, if it's larger, it means that the amount of cash which the firm has related, uh, relative to its interest expense is larger. The next set of ratios are the profitability ratios. And these ratios measure how much profit the firm is making relative to uh, sales or assets. Now, the first one is the gross profit margin, which is defined as gross profits divided by net sales. The more, uh, the higher this gross profit margin is, it means that the firm is being able to generate more profits for a given amount of sales. So that's a good thing. Operating profit margin is operating profit divided by net sales. Net profit margin is net income divided by net sales. Next, we come to some measures of uh, returns. And return on assets, or ROA, is net income divided by total assets. Return on equity, ROE, which is a very widely used uh, measure, is net income divided by the amount of equity. And this is the book value of equity. After profitability ratios, we look at some market value ratios. And we have two of them here, both of which are very important, uh, which are very widely used. The first one is earnings per share, which is uh, defined as the earnings which the firm has divided by shares outstanding. 
the price earning ratio or P ratio is the market price of the firm or the market price of one stock of the firm divided by the earnings per share. And this number, price earning ratio, is very uh, common. People use it, uh, refer to it a lot uh, in their analysis uh, when they're comparing firms which are in the same industry and have um, similar kind of markets or customers, they will compare their price earning ratios. The DuPont system links the balance sheet and income statement. Now this DuPont system enables an analyst to understand why a firm has a higher or a lower return on equity. So you start by noting that return on assets is net income by total assets and that can be rewritten as net income divided by sales multiplied by sales divided by total assets. Now net income by sales is also known as profit margin and it measures operating efficiency. Sales by total assets is also known as total assets turnover and it measures the efficiency of the use of assets. So what we have done at the very first step is that we have divided the return of, on assets into two parts, one of which is the profit margin and the other one is the total assets turnover and now you can understand that the return on assets depends on the operating efficiency and the efficiency in the use of assets and if you improve either one of them it is going to lead to an increase in the return on assets. Next we come to the DuPont equation where we note that return on equity equals return on assets multiplied by equity multiplier. And what is the equity multiplier? Well, the equity multiplier is total assets divided by equity or equivalently debt plus equity divided by equity. In a very uh, simple uh, balance sheet, you would say that total assets equal debt plus equity. Now, this can then be re rewritten as return on equity equals profit margin multiplied by total assets turnover multiplied by equity multiplier. So now that you have these three different parts, you can examine each part individually to understand which part is higher and which part is lower or to decide which of these three you would like to increase so as to increase return on equity. So now that you've learned about a few ratios, uh, say you go ahead and compute a few ratios. And once you have a ratio, the next question is now what? Uh, let's say price earning ratio for a firm turns out to be 12. And what is the significance of it? What are you going to do with it? Well, what you need is you need something else to compare it with. So you need a benchmark. So we have to select a benchmark and there are three kinds of benchmarks. One is trend analysis, the second is industry analysis and the third is peer group analysis. In trend analysis what we do is that we have the same firm and we look at how the ratios are changing 
with time. So what is the trend of those ratios? In industry analysis, we look at the ratios for a firm and compare them to ratios for other firms. For example, if you look at the ratio for Google and you look at the ratio for Yahoo, they are in the same industry, and you look at the price earning ratios for both of them, you may find that Google has a higher price earning ratio compared to Yahoo. And then the question is, you know, why is that so? Well, that's probably because uh, the market believes that Google has better growth prospects compared to Yahoo. So in industry analysis, you're looking at uh, ratios for the for firms in the same industry. And if you want one level better uh, comparison, then what you could do instead is you can look at peer group analysis. A peer group is composed of firms that are similar in size, sales, and market. So two firms may be in the same industry, but they may not be in the same peer group. So when you're looking at peer group, you're not just satisfied with looking at firms in the same industry, but you're really looking for firms which are doing the same kind of uh, uh, thing. They have the same kind of uh, customers, and they're competing with each other.